from time to time collection managers and research scientists in the museum are asked to identify materials seized by um, customs or APIS as yeah. it's coming into Australia. And this particular um, job was conducted by the SOPAC, Department of Sustainability and Environment, Water Protection and Communities, and they um, had reason to believe that someone had been importing wildlife products illegally and that many of these products were listed on um, CITES, the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. So they approached um, me at the museum to give them some assistance to identify those materials. Right, well, usually I take a CITES list with me, so I've got a general idea about uh, which species are listed or not. My particular focus is mammals, but of course there were also, um, there are often reptiles and birds as well. Um, so in terms of mammals, when I'm actually on site, uh, the main purpose is just to look at broad categories of, of mammals. So for instance, all primates are listed on CITES, all um, cats, all felids, bears, um, all rhinoceroses and you know, yeah. elephants yeah. and things like that. And then some groups, only some species within a group are listed. Yeah. So if there's any doubt, then all items are seized. But some things are very easy. If you see a primate, you go right as a primate. It doesn't matter which species it is, you no. know it's on site. Whereas other things are a bit more tricky. Some of the sloths, some species will be listed and others won't. Yeah. So if you're not sure, it's better to take it and then do a more detailed um, identification later. Pretty much species from all over the world. Um, okay. Certainly a lot of um, African material, a lot of North American and also Southeast Asian as well as some Australian. Mm -hmm. uh, the Australian material is not subject to the same laws, although it is protected under different laws. Okay. Uh, so yes, a broad representative of different groups, um, you know, as I mentioned, bears, cats, sloths, rhinos, marine mammals, walrus, seals, everything, a whole range of, of species and different forms too. A lot um, pelts and um, yeah. also mounted animals as well as skulls and also parts of animals, hair and teeth, claws, yeah. so it's a lot of claws as well, which makes it quite tricky. If you've just got a part of an animal, it's a lot harder to identify than if you've got, say, a whole skull or a whole skin. Well, in this case, it was reasonably hard. If it, if it had occurred at the museum, it would have been ideal because we have such fantastic um, reference collections here. So you, you could actually just go to a particular group and look at the skulls and compare the features. Um, because there was so much material and I had to travel to Canberra, I, was, I took a lot of reference material with me, not, not specimens, but um, identification guides, keys, books, um, also really good websites as well, um, forensic websites that, that, that were quite helpful too. So I took um, you know, calipers and you know, we're measuring, <laughs> measuring distances and trying to key out skulls as well. Mm -hmm. Some things are really obvious when you look at them immediately. There was a lot of orangutan skulls which you can immediately identify because they're so distinctive. Mm -hmm. And some of the ivory as well, walrus ivory is um, was quite, quite distinct as well as elephant ivory. Yes, we are. Often they seize just one or two items and they'll bring them down. Um, and we can make a determination on them. Also the DNA lab gets a lot of similar inquiries um, because often it's um, a part of an animal that you can't recognise externally and so they'll, they'll take a sample and um, sequence it and, and get a definite idea as well. Mm -hmm. But no, we're often identify, asked to identify a single one or two items at a time. Yeah. If it was something unusual, you could extract um, a hair or a skin sample from a specimen in the museum's collection and get DNA from that and then compare it to DNA extracted from the recovered item. Often uh, there are already records of the DNA on GenBank, which is a, a series of um, um, DNA profiles that the forensic people can use as a as backup. So it's often not needed to actually go ahead and sequence. But if it was something that wasn't on GenBank, for instance, then we had one, then it certainly would be possible um, to do that. While we were identifying uh, the material, um, a photographer took a series of detailed photographs of the skulls and so for things that I needed to follow up on, for instance, if I wasn't sure on the spot, I couldn't get it to species, I could only get it to genus, for instance, um, they'll send me the images and so I can look at the images <coughs> and compare it <coughs> sorry, to the skulls in the museum's collection and, and look at the, the features and say, ah oh, yes, it's definitely this species or, mm -hmm. or that one. So there will be some follow up as well.